All right, uh, I think we can get started. Thank you all for joining us for today's Lunchtime Art Talk, which as many of you know, is a weekly series led by Hammer Curators on works from our collection. This series will fo focus on artists featured in Made in LA, a version. As the galleries are unfortunately closed to the public due to the pandemic, we thought it was important to highlight works by incredible artists selected for this year's biennial. My name is Erin. Hey everyone, I'm Erin Cristobal. I'm the Associate Curator at the Hammer Museum and I'll be facilitating this afternoon's talk on Brandon Landers. Uh, joining me today is my colleague, Curatorial Assistant Vanessa Arismendi, who will be helping me answer all your questions later on in the program. Um, just a few Zoom notes before we begin. Uh, when the presentation starts, please select speaker view in the top right corner of your screen. And in the top middle of your screen, please click on view options to ensure side by side and fit to window are checked. Um, please note that today's program is being recorded. So you have the option to toggle your camera on and off using the camera icon in the bottom left corner, whatever you feel most comfortable with. Um, you'll remain on mute until the end of the presentation, at which point Vanessa will help me unmute those who have questions. During the presentation, if you have any questions for me or Vanessa, including any technical issues, you can ask those using the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. Okay. Um, all right, so I guess we'll get started. Um, excited, I see some last name Landers in the house. So I, I, I hope the family's with us, which is really great. Um, I just wanna start this off by saying, you know, I, I think the first time I saw Brandon's work um, was in a small gallery show in LA, like back in 2015 or 16. And I was just so enamored by his work and his painting style. And so I reached out to him and I did a studio visit with him back in 2017. And I drove all the way up to Bakersfield to see his work. And when I met Brandon, he was just this incredible, you know, energy and spirit who had tons and tons of paintings just stacked on top of each other um, in his studio. And it was so clear that, you know, Brandon had just created this universe and this language for himself and his works and the people that he depicts um, that is just so otherworldly. Um, while at the same time sort of man maintaining some sort of integrity in reality. Um, so I wanted to just read something, a little description I put together of his works in general. Um, and then we're gonna talk about the painting Wonders. So while I'm reading this, we can go through some of his other paintings um, beforehand, okay. Living and working in Bakersfield, and born and raised in South Central Los Angeles, Brandon Lander centers the Black Quotidian, depicting everyday scenes of his friends, family, and community, while simultaneously invoking the realms of memory, imagination, and the fantastic. Amassing layers upon layers of thick oil paint that sit on top of each other like rough patchwork, Landers renders yellows, browns, blacks, and reds in order to depict the richness and multivalent skin tones of black Angelinos, and by extension, the regal descendants of the great migration. I appreciate that when you speak to Landers, it's clear that he doesn't need to rely on art history or a painterly canon to validate his work. He rather turns his focus to a larger appreciation of black excellence and an ongoing legacy of black cultural production. I also appreciate that Landers is not a product of the usual LA art scene, but rather is a proud alumni of Cal State Bakersfield who handcrafts and stretches his own canvases and has generated a painting technique entirely his own. 
When I step into Lander's universe, I'm struck by the ways in which intimacy and familiarity rub against the grotesque and sometimes violent. The way in which characters are animated, fueled by 90s cartoons and John Singleton movies, to gaze back at the viewer, holding court for all to see. I see the collage turn painterly like Romare Bearden, I see raw energetic groupings like Robert Colescott. I see the privileging of the everyday like Clementine Hunter. And I see the toothy grins of an early Carrie James Marshall self-portrait. Landers is an astronaut propelling into the future and what we call our ancestors' wildest dreams. Okay. So now that I'm done waxing poetic about Brandon, because he's amazing, um, we will get into this particular piece, Wonders, which I wanted to just sit with for a minute. Um, so as you know, um, Brandon created this incredible group of works, which you just saw for um, Made in LA uh, 2020. And so all of these wor works were made last year. And we can't help but think of what has transpired over the last year um, and what that means and how, how that sort of sits into a painting. Um, and so I settled on this particular work because there's just so much going on, um, so much that we can relate to, um, so much that invokes a Black experience. Um, and I wanted to just sort of walk us through this cast, cast of characters that we see here. Um, so I wanted to start off with the man on the left, um, which is depicted after a friend of Brandon's who works for the city. Um, he's a construction worker. And, you know, when I spoke to Brandon about him, he was just really adamant about showing, you know, this is the everyday, you know, this is the, the blue collar, you know, this is someone who, um, you know, creates, constructs, uh, buildings and builds worlds um, and showing the power in that, you know, the power that often gets overlooked by, I think, you know, jobs that require a sort of labor. Um, on the right, you see two women, uh, one which is Lander's cousin and the other which is a friend of Lander's. And what I find most amazing about them is their gaze. Um, these are two incredibly powerful Black women, it's clear, that are gazing back at the viewer um, and sort of, you know, checking us out. <laughs> um, I love that, you know, you see Black Queen depicted on one of their shirts um, and just the way in which they're depicted, it's very stoic. Um, when you get down to the children here, uh, when I talked to Brandon about this particular piece, you know, he really wanted the children as a mass to, to be sort of a representation of childhood, um, which I said earlier, he's often invoking, you know, memories and things like that. And so what I love here is that there is this sort of clear divide between, um, you know, the adults in the painting, right, which are sort of, you know, stoic and doing their thing versus this clear fantastical realm that these kids are living in, right? And how often we see that in domestic spaces, right? There's like the world of the adults, the world of the children, and sometimes they swirl together like two cosmos. Um, and so what you see here with these children, you know, these are, these are 90s babies, right? We have Ghostbusters on our left here. Um, we have Count Dracula, um, you know, sort of the centerpiece of the image, in my opinion. We have a young hero holding a Cracker Barrel four piece, four pack, which, you know, if anyone remembers, you know, the Cracker Barrels, you know, the, the crackers themselves were terrible, but it was all about the little treat that was hidden at the bottom of it, right? Or the popcorn. Um, and then you have this young girl here. And so I just love the ways in which, you know, he has allowed these children um, to dream, you know, to imagine 
um, to costume themselves um, in ways that they would like to be seen, which I think is so important specifically for Black children. Um, what's also interesting about this is in the background, clearly there's a TV playing. And, you know, it's sort of hard to make out, but basically what is being depicted on the television is um, a group of police officers arresting a young black man. And this was a very powerful sort of abstracted image to pull out for me because um, it immediately took me back to 1992, um, thinking about the uprisings, thinking about Rodney King and thinking about how important TV and media um, was in that entire process. Um, but then what was also interesting about that is that the fact that this piece was made in you know, 2020 last year, I can't help but think of George Floyd in the same way that that um, you know, violent occurrence um, of his death, of his murder, um, was depicted and then disseminated across the digital realm. And so when I asked Brandon about, you know, this image and I was like, you know, are you referring to the 92 uprisings? Are you referring to George Floyd? And Brandon's answer was actually so sort of genius and prescient. He basically was like, you know, it, it can be that, it can be that and, you know, it's both and in that these are occurrences that happen every day across our nation um, in which Black folks are murdered and killed by the hands of police violence, right? And those are just two, you know, moments in which those occurrences ripped open something, ripped open a new activism. Um, but this is something that occurs every day and it's something that um, a lot of us live with every day. Um, and so I love that, you know, sort of juxtaposed with what's occurring on the television. Uh, you see a little VCR um, atop the television that says Selma on it. Um, and so you're immediately then sort of like propelled into, you know, the, the film, obviously, that was directed and produced by Ava DuVernay, um, de depicting the march on Selma um, and, you know, thinking through voting rights and how that was such a monumentous occasion. Um, and so I think what's so incredible about this, this image is that it is such um, a deeply intimate depiction, I think, of so many Black folks lived experience where you are sort of coupling the imagination, the fantastic, the violent, the hopeful, um, the family unit, um, and all of those feelings and emotions and lived experiences and actions, I think, get collapsed into one singular body um, that truly represents America. Um, so we'll go to the next image. Um, so, you know, that was the image that I wanted to sort of focus on from the show. Um, but I also wanted to bring us back to this incredible painting that Brandon did in 2019 called Face in the World. Um, and I had the pleasure of seeing this painting at MMB Gallery when Brandon did a solo show there. And what you see here is a really beautiful dedication to Nipsey Hussle. Um, Nipsey Hussle, who passed away in March of 2019, um, was not only a rapper, but he was um, a proud gang member. He was a community member. Um, he was a businessman. And he essentially was an entrepreneur and a hustler who, you know, was dedicated to his community in South Central and Black folks, I think, around the world. 
Um, and so I love that, you know, in light of Nipsey's passing, um, Nipsey's back is faced towards us. But I think mo more importantly, his face is faced towards his community that loves and supports him, of folks who live in South Central. And I think what's also interesting is that at the top right corner, you can actually see a sort of tracing or beginnings of a, a stark white household and stark white people. And I thought that that particular aspect of this painting was so incredible to sort of gently place gentrification um, on the plane of, you know, of, of South Central. And it's sort of the embarking, you know, the sort of pioneer embarking aspect of it that you see here. Um, and how, you know, Nipsey was so against that and was so rooted in supporting local businesses and communities and the youth um, in these areas that, you know, really um, hold a, a legacy of black and brown Angelinos. Um, so yeah, um, I just, I wanted to focus on those two paintings. Um, and I just wanted to actually end, uh, with a quote from Brandon, because, um, one thing that Brandon does that I really love, it's kind of like his signature in a way, is he places these electrical sockets, um, in different parts of his paintings. And they're always just sort of sitting there stagnant and you're sort of wondering what they represent. Um, and when I asked him about that, he said, black folks are walking natural resources. We're always plugged in, ready to go. We're the plug, we're the source. And I think that that's a great way to just sum up, I think, his artistic vision which is uh, just an ongoing desire to depict everyday black folk in their most excellent selves, um, in their multivalent selves and a sort of celebration of a black experience. Thank you. Thank you, Erin, that was beautiful. Hi everyone, my name is Vanessa. I'll be helping Erin moderate our Q and A today. As a reminder, if you have any questions for Aaron about Brandon's work, please drop your questions in the chat. You can also raise your hand physically and I'll try to keep an eye out for everyone to unmute you. And you can also raise your hand digitally using the participants button at the bottom of your screen. So I think I'll actually kick off the Q&A with one of my own questions, Aaron. I think um, touching on the electrical socket, I, I also wanted to ask you if you can speak on um, I love the way that Brandon often mirrors in the paintings, either, you know, you see mirror text, so it appears backwards to us, or there's the electrical socket, or there are TVs facing us or mirrors facing us. And I was wondering if you could talk about this sort of engagement with the idea of the portal and mm. like the surreal space of the portal um, yeah. and the transformational space of the portal. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, electrical sockets are portals in this way. They, they hold energy or they're like an energy source, right? And so I think that, you know, I was saying earlier that Brandon is an astronaut in this way, because I think, um, again, as much as his paintings are, are rooted in the everyday and sort of, you know, our everyday reality, there is, there's these incredible moments in which um, either he depicts a person or, you know, the space that they're in is sort of um, lopsided or incongruent. Um, there's always this way in which I think his, his the everyday becomes a new world. Um, and so I think the portal is something that's really important to him because it's a way, it's a space where you can sort of, um, yeah, I think it's a space where you can, you can, yeah, you can enter another world, I guess. Um, yeah. 
And so I, I like to think of, you know, these electrical sockets as portals, maybe perhaps of ways in which we enter his worlds. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like in Twin Peaks, isn't that a thing in Twin Peaks? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't going to drop the David Lynch reference, but since you brought you it up, you yes. <laughs> exactly like in Twin Peaks. Yeah. And I guess on the topic of like energy transfer and energy tapping, I also wonder if you can talk about, I love the way that, that Brandon plays with material as well. You know, the way he physically paints you know, with the palette knife instead of the brush or, you know, in some of the older paintings where he's repurposed frames that I guess, I think they were thrifted or found. Um, so if you can talk about his relationship to different materials and what he evokes by using often found material. Yeah, absolutely. And I wanted to get into that a bit, like his use of the palette knife is, is really important for his technique. And so what you see on these canvases, I mean, it's a shame we can't, you know, witness them in person because they're just like filled, you know, washed over with these incredible textures that you can feel. They're very visceral when you encounter them. Um, and these canvases are really just layers and layers and layers of oil paint on top of each other. Um, which is how you get these incredible, what I was sort of saying earlier, like patchwork like depictions of people where you can see these beautiful hues and shifts in their skin tones and, you know, what they're wearing. Um, and I just find that very unique in a technique that is entirely his own. Um, in terms of like found objects, you know, I think Brandon is extremely resourceful um, and is, you know, someone who I think is, you know, DIY in every sense of the word. And so again, I love the fact that he is not necessarily a product of, you know, some of our LA art schools, but I think is someone who, you know, in Bakersfield and with the support of um, a few different professors is someone who has like, um, I think garnered like a very intimate approach to painting, um, building his own canvases, reusing them, painting on top of them. Um, and I just really appreciate that. Um, we also have a question from Connie Butler. What do you make of, or how does Brandon explain the two very different ways he uses paint? Oh, we, we're talking about paint. Some of the paintings are very flat with lots of scraping back under the canvas while other paintings, like the first one you showed, are very thick with paint and built up. Any thoughts? So I guess we touched on that. Okay. Um, Richard Buckley, we have a couple of questions about uh, the mirrored words, which, which we touched on a little bit, but I don't know if you have anything more to say about this act of mirroring that happens in the paintings, often with text. Um, I mean, not that much to say, but I think it's just like, it, the, I think the mirrored text does something where it sort of reminds you that you're in this alternate reality. You know, that even though this reality looks or seemingly is supposed to be our everyday, that that text, I think, really does something where it brings you out of that and sort of, you know, um, makes you question um, where this space is. So I think that that's a technique similar to, you know, the electrical socket or also similar to, I think, even some of the ways in which he depicts um, faces, you know, I, th I find it interesting that, you know, people are always smiling. There's like these very grotesque grins um, that, you know, historically is like a faux pas, I think, in painting and something that he really, um, you know, just, yeah, he, he sort of takes on. And so I think there's all these slight strategies that Brandon incorporates in, into his works to sort of flip them on top of their head, so to speak, and to, you know, I think make you sit a bit longer with them and realize that these aren't just sort of everyday scenes. Hmm. And Ike is asking, can you speak to the evolution of how Brandon engages foreground versus background? I know you visited his studio and one thing that struck me when I was 
up there is how there's a growing confidence in the canvas expressed, especially in the backgrounds, how they're more built up and evocative. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can see that, I think, in some of the works that are in the show, that the background is just as present as the foreground. And I agree, Ike, that I think in the past, um, there was a sharper focus on um, you know, depicting the, the people in his work, um, but now the backgrounds are being sort of more fleshed out. Um, and I think that that's great, you know, and it's interesting when I was talking to Brandon recently, um, you know, I was like, what do you have coming up? What's going on? And Brandon was really adamant about just wanting time to focus and evolve on uh, um, his work. And so I love that there's this like very voracious painterly pursuit um, by Brandon to sort of continue to explore these canvases. Um, and so I think that, you know, um, I, I just hope the work gets bigger, more detailed, um, you know, evolves more. Um, and, you know, I think specifically in that Nipsey Hussle piece, um, Face in the World, you see uh, the way in which the background becomes implicated into the foreground in the way that that, um, that that house, you know, that white trace of the house and those trace of people are sort of coming into the foreground, a sort of um, almost like um, looking into the future of what South Central LA could become and, and sort of the, you know, the realities, the everyday realities of gentrification and, you know, the changing infrastructure and construction that's currently going on in those spaces and, and what that means for Black and Brown communities who have been there for decades. Um, Jerry Horwitz is asking a technical question. Are the surfaces of the paintings completely impasto or are there any areas or washes and exposed under drawing with pencil or other media? That I actually don't know. I feel like that's a Brandon question. Um, yeah, so unfortunately, I actually don't know that. Um, another question is, can you comment more on the iconography in the first painting you showed, specifically the pointing of the main male figure and the mask on the young boy? two images seen in Renaissance and Baroque paintings. And I was gonna comment actually, that you mentioned a little bit about the religious aspect as well. Um, so this like is- Early the, Christian or something. This was in reference to the wonders piece? Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, just to go back, I mean, the, the masked boy is supposed to sort of mimic Count Dracula. Um, and something that I really appreciate about Brandon is he has such a beautiful relationship with his mom. And, you know, growing up, he said that, you know, him and his mom loved making costumes together. Um, and so I think, you know, as I said, this group of children represents his childhood. You know, this was a space in which him and his mom, I think, worked together on countless costumes um, for him to sort of imagine himself in these, you know, these different uh, personas or characters. Um, and so I think that that, you know, I love the way in which that particular masked boy is sort of right in the centerpiece of the painting and does this thing that I spoke of earlier, this sort of strategy to break away from the norm, to sort of warp reality. Um, so I feel like that's what the, the sort of Count Dracula figure is representing. Um, and then the man in the construction outfit. So I said that that's actually one of Brandon's friends. Um, and even though Brandon is based in Bakersfield, um, obviously he has so many memories of growing up in LA and so many friends from growing up in LA. And so um, that's one of his friends who is a construction worker now. And he felt that it was really important to, you know, prioritize, prioritize or, you know, validate, I think, um, you know, this, this, you know, the construction and um, the everyday labor of people um, that is in support of, I think, building worlds, you know. Mm -hmm. um, 
So yeah, I think both characters are doing two very different things in the painting, but it is interesting that they come together mm -hmm. um, in this world. And formerly they are kind of religious, like they immediately reminded me of like Byzantine, you mm -hmm. know, mosaics or paintings where the pointing does happen and there's like right. a movement of action across the canvas. Um, it looks like we have time for one more question, which is from Crystal Perez. Uh, are the people he paints people he knows or are they made up? Uh, both actually. So um, just going back to that particular painting. So the adults are all, all, all people he knows. So his friends and his cousin, whereas the group of children are really sort of a representation of his childhood. Um, and so he likes sort of mixing in both things. I mean, sometimes he'll do direct, um, you know, sort of direct paintings of portraits or photography or, you know, familial archives that he'll receive. Sometimes he'll do like a direct painting from that. Um, but otherwise, as I said, he's always sort of thinking through like how to warp the familiar which is when he brings in, I think, these other characters. Um, and so I love that they're sort of placed on top of people you can recognize, people you're not sure of. Um, it's sort of a mix of his mind and reality in this really beautiful way. I know I said that was the last question, but we're getting a couple about where we can see Brandon's work right now that Made in LA is closed. Do you know of any uh, gallery shows happening soon? Um, I actually don't believe Brandon has any shows currently on view outside of Made in LA, um, but we're going to cross our fingers and hope that Made in LA can open soon. Um, and, uh, you know, even though I, I think I showed just paintings that are housed at the Hammer, there's also another set of paintings at the Huntington Library that are just as excellent. So hopefully we'll have a chance to see both in both locations. All right, um, I think that's it. Thank you, Erin. Thank you everybody for being here. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, shout out to Brandon's family who's here. I see y'all. Um, let's see, I'm gonna, uh, Thank you for joining us. Um, special thanks to Bank of America for presenting Made in LA 2020 Aversion. Um, to support programs like this and future programs, we invite you to become a Hammer member or donate to the museum by visiting us at hammer.ucla.edu slash support. Um, and, you know, be sure to join us at next week's Lunchtime Art Talk, where our chief curator, Connie Butler, will present on Made in LA artist, Sir Surpus. Thank you all and have a good Wednesday. <laughs>